So this is uh, the Corn Belt. You can see this is corn production across counties in the United States, and you can see that uh, there's an awful lot of corn grown in North Central Sarah. And uh, there is uh, my clicker working. Uh, yeah. Ah, there we go. Okay, so has the Corn Belt lost a third of its topsoil? This is not, the question is not whether it has lost a depth of one third of the depth of the topsoil, whether it has lost all of the topsoil over a third of the land. And a couple of researchers from Massachusetts uh, took a lot of satellite data and a little bit of on the ground data. And they decided that every place that has a slope like this, sort of a hill, has uh, lost a fair amount of its topsoil. And every place it's a trough is lost generally less. But some of those troughs have lost a lot because they've water is flowing through those troughs. And so in the picture on the left here, the red areas, like the red thing, are the tops of little hills. And the blue areas are the bottoms of little hills. And the spaces outlined in black, they think, have lost all of their topsoil. <laughs> and and uh, so if you're at the slope, if you see this uh, arrow that dropped over here, this yellow arrow, is showing that if the slope on your soil is two and a half degrees, you've lost, like 50% of that soil has lost all of its topsoil. There's not a lot of slope involved here to get to that point. So uh, if you're on these really level places, you're farming in topsoil. But if you're in those high, high slope places, like three or four degrees of slope, you're probably farming in clay. Probably not optimal. So, um, you know, if you repair that slowly, you're kind of risking everything. It's you're not going to. It's not going to be easy to keep up with the degradation, the way we are farming. And so, the uh, dirt, the erosion of civilizations, famous book. If you haven't read it, you would probably enjoy it. And then, uh, dirt. But you know, even though you have dirt, you can move on to soil. So G Gabe Brown has shown us that you can. Uh, move from dirt to soil. So Gabe Brown, if you don't know his story, he uh, had four catastrophic years trying to farm a uh, property in North Dakota. He had two years of hail, which destroyed everything in his that he had planted after it had sprouted. And then he had a year of drought. And then he had another year of hail. And at that point, he couldn't get loans from the farmer from the bank anymore. And so he would like turn the cattle loose in the field to grazed down sorghum because he couldn't afford baling water or baling twine. He was broke. And that began his regenerative journey. He couldn't till anymore. He couldn't apply fertilizer. He's, he's broke. <clears throat> and this worked. So, uh, but that takes a while. So that's four years of disasters for Gabe Browns, three years for conversion to a officially to an organic process, or, you know, organic label process. So um, I was interested in, can you do this like really, really fast? Can you do this in a year? Can you do this in a season? And, like what would it take to do that? So this is a proposal to repair degraded soil in one winter season. And I don't know that this works, but this is a talk about ideas and it's a work in progress talk will be producing final results next year at this time, I hope. So, um, you know about the soil damage. The soil damage comes from a lot of physical activity, tilling and rain and wind and stuff. There's also a bunch of chemical impairments from uh, organic matter oxidizing. We're harvesting minerals, we're eluting minerals. That means that they're getting dissolved in the water and flowing away. <clears throat> There's herbicides, pesticides, and waste. And, uh, the, and so, that's all the physical and chemical stuff, but then there's these biological effects. The biological effects are really interesting. So if you have a monoculture, then you lose all the symbiosis between the plants. If you've oxidized the soil organic matter by tilling, now you have hungry microbes all over the place. Remember the uh, kind of mental image is that there are two elephants worth of microbes in every acre of soil. And so you're not feeding them when you've 
degraded all the soil organic matter. If you have two hungry elephants <laughs> dying <laughs> of starvation. Fertilizer also starves the microbes because <clears throat> plants have this fascinating ability to request nutrients from microbes. And they actually produce sugars that they send down into the roots, but they also produce hormones that go down into the roots and they tell the fungi and the microbiome down there what they need. So if they need zinc, they'll send different stuff into the soil and ask for zinc. And then microbes will send it back and then when they have enough zinc, they'll ask for whatever's limiting now. So there's this incredible on-demand system. This is an economy that works better than any human economy you've ever seen in history. It's a fantastic achievement. And yet um, we interfere with it by adding fertilizer that tells the plant, I've got enough zinc, I've got enough magnesium, I've got enough of whatever. I don't need to talk to the, to the fungi. I don't need to build that economy. I don't need to have these partners that are reaching six feet into the soil to reach whatever they need. And so I'll just starve them out because I'm already happy. I've got my you know, universal basic fertilizer income here and I don't need anything else. So <clears throat> anyway, the fertilizer is starving microbes. Herbicides are poisoning the microbes and also farmers and pesticides are killing beneficial insects and also beneficial farmers. So is there an affordable exponential way to fix this instead of like going out and finding soil from someplace else in the world and trucking it in? Can we do something else to make this work? And so my previous management trials have been <clears throat> taking uh, these plots of land, the red stuff in the front is uh, amaranth. Um, there's also corn and soybean, or corn and uh, cowpeas and uh, okra back there. And I've been using scads of coffee ground leaf mold, leaf mold uh, compost and putting that down. I've also used a lot of uh, trace minerals at different times. So I've been adding cobalt and molybdenum and copper and whatever else the soil assays told me I needed. And <clears throat> comparing that to a basic NPK fertilizer regimen as directed by University of Missouri Extension, sorry. And, um, and then raising the same crops on both sides. So that's what the pairing is there. And then with minimal watering, there's not an irrigation system here. And then doing an elemental survey of the edible stuff that came out of those plants. Because remember, I'm a physician first, and I'm supposed to heal people. And I don't think that metformin is quite cutting it. <clears throat> so uh, all this compost, and this is a pile of coffee grounds and, and leaves getting turned by a, a little tractor and my, my nephew. Um, so the soil organic matter has risen from like 2% or less to 5% or more. And so that's great. It's the oddball thing that's happened, which is we've lowered the nickel level in most of these plants. So the nickel level is actually at a, at a point where it would be toxic for some people. Some people have a sensitivity to nickel. And for those people, I have crops that if they're grown on the NPK side, they're toxic. And if they're grown on the, the regenerative side, they're not toxic because they threshold, the nickel drops below the threshold that uh, would cause trouble. Um, if I see heavy metals, it's always on the NPK side. So I see cadmium or antimony or some crazy thing that we don't want. It's always on the NPK side. It's never on the organic side, the regenerative side. And uh, I have a better microbiome. I know I have a better microbiome. But this is a half inch of compost annually, which is 13,000 gallons per acre per year. <laughs> <laughs> so that's 30 tons per acre. And that's not really a very practical way to scale up. So can you grow the compost from seed? So there's occasionally done the cover crop thing. So this is uh, cover crop wheat and cover crop wheat is growing much more densely on the, the near side of this picture. <clears throat> I actually couldn't cut that with a, with a mower. I had to go out with a scythe and <laughs> slice it down and then, and then till it in. Um, that's the regenerative side. The other side is the NPK side. It was fine with a mower. You just cut through it with a mechanical mower. <clears throat> so uh, if we do grow the compost in place, of course, we're not destroy disturbing the soil anymore. And that's one of our uh, you know, five principles or six principles of, of uh, regenerative management, according to Gabe Brown. And <clears throat> the cover crop is going to block the wind and rain, channel the rain into the soil, shade the soil from the sun, add soil organic matter. 
first from the root mass, second from the leaf mass, but then extra benefit, pretty important, also the microbial mass. So those microbes that it's going to grow while it's uh, harvesting sunlight, even in the winter, are going to add to the um, soil organic matter. It's going to suppress weeds, support microbes, and uh, even maybe tap into mineral reservoirs down deep. But will that work? Can you make that, will that work quickly enough and grow enough material if the soil is already half sterile from the previous management strategies of dumping pesticides and herbicides and fertilizer on it? <clears throat> will there be herbicide residues that cause trouble? And would it help to have to harness the power of epigenetics. <laughs> so, uh, these are ideas that are going to come together in, a, in just a minute. Uh, in the Teeming with series of uh, books from Jeff Lowenfels, who seems to devote a lot of time to the cannabis, um, this, this particular latest ed edition in the series describes endophytic bacteria. So, an endophytic bacteria is involved in a rhizophagy cycle. There's a lot of big words. Rhizos are roots, phagy is eating. The plants are eating the bacteria through their roots. They strip off the outer wall of the bacteria. That is an important nutritional source for the plant. The bacteria changes from being you know, some rod shape to being a blob because it's lost its cell wall. It's no longer being held together the way it used to be. That enters the plant cell. It reproduces in the plant cell, kind of like it's also benefiting from having all these sugars and things shipped down to it. And so the bacteria is reproducing in the plant, invades all through the plant, goes up into the seeds and the fruit and the leaves and every place. And then <clears throat> some of those bacteria make it back down to the root and they get shoved out of the root. And guess what happens when it gets shoved out of the root? You get a root hair. That's how root hairs form on <laughs> practically all of our plants, as far as we can tell. And this is a more general thing than, than mycorrhizal fungi. So brassicas like cabbage and broccoli and stuff, those are all brassicas. They don't have relationships with, with uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. Amaranth doesn't have relationships with, with mycorrhizal fungi, but the, all these plants are gonna have relationships with endophytes. The endophyte is all through the plant, helping the plant. The plant can shove it out and make it do interesting new things. That's a significant source of nutrients. Uh, so you got a Barden, who's also uh, one of our hosts here today uh, at a different track. <clears throat> His PhD thesis is about training bacterial communities to digest atrazine. So he's got an herbicide, and he thinks that if you expose a compost pile to the herbicide, the compost pile will learn or select for or something, something happens that ramps up the ability of that compost pile to digest that herbicide. Okay, so that's interesting too. Maybe we could use that. And then you can organically create a genetically modified organism. This is the um, epigenetic idea. So epigenetics is a process where <clears throat> when you stress an organism, whether it's a starving mom in the Netherlands in World War II or a plant in the field, that the, the DNA on that plant will get changed. Cytosine residues will get methylated. So there's actually a change in the DNA <clears throat> or there's a change in a protein that's near the DNA that turns off or turns on genes. So it's genetically modified in place. And when you raise a plant in your garden and take the seeds from that plant, those seeds are genetically modified to work really well in your garden. <laughs> if you buy your seeds from Maine or Oregon, they are not going to be genetically modified to work well in Nebraska or Missouri. So the closer you can raise those seeds to the place where you're going to plant them, the more genetically modified they are going to be to, for your setting. All right, so um, next interesting idea is that seed pellets can carry microbes. You could 
infuse a seed pellet, which is going to be a seed with a wrapper of clay and compost around it, maybe other things, biochar maybe. <clears throat> and you can infuse that with some of these microbes. So we've just given you a bunch of microbes to think about and special seeds to think about. <clears throat> so there are issues with it. So the, the pellet has to stay together while it's <laughs> waiting to be planted. This is an issue, it turns out. Um, the pH of the pellet and the salts in the pellet can kill the microbes. So you don't want to kill the microbes. You wanted the microbes, right? We're trying to, trying to use those. And the seedling has to be able to get out. So if you, uh oh, and, and, the, and you don't want slugs and mice to eat your thing. And so you want to protect it, but you have to protect it in a way that allows the seed to emerge, the seedling to emerge. So this is all tricky. So the fast region materials were to take uh, coffee grounds and leaves and uh, mix them up in a tumbler composter. And then every week we'd give it to a more and more toxic dose of four different herbicides that my partner farmer is using on his nearby fields. So we're exposing this compost pile to 2,4-D, atrazine, glufosinate, and glyphosate. And I kind of thought it would kill all the worms, but it didn't. <laughs> There's plenty of worms growing in this compost pile, in this, in this tumbler. So they're, anyway, you've got this tumbler full of compost that's been exposed to a lot of stuff. And I have no idea if it's really digesting atrazine or not, but it's been exposed to a lot of atrazine. <clears throat> Next set is uh, symbiotic compost. So I thought, well, we'll take coffee grounds and leaves and we'll put those in a compost pile. And then when I've harvested uh, some cover crop that I'm gonna use, I'll put that in there too. And it'll carry in with it the endophytes, those bacteria that were supposed to be added. <clears throat> and now I'll have a special wheat, a special pea, and a special camelina um, compost. So the wheat, the winter wheat I have, and the winter pea that I have, and the camelina that I have will live through the winter, no matter what happens. This two degrees cold spell is about to hit. It's okay. They'll be fine. <clears throat> and then we have a big uh, kiln to make biochar. We'll talk about that more tomorrow. Uh, but anyway, you take the biochar, sieve it, get some ultra fine material, and there's really fine material that you could use to hold things in the in the seed ball. <clears throat> and so then the intervention plan is to have these locally grown seeds. So we also planted wheat, the, the camelina, harvested the seeds. And so now we're gonna take those, put them in a mixer, make seed balls, and make the seed balls using uh, kind of water run through each of those composts to try and grab some of the endophytes. This is not quite the best possible plan, but this is what I proposed. <clears throat> and then there's a bunch of treatments. And so there's different strategies for, you know, whether to put down nothing, put down, the seeds with the uh, uh, with spray on it, or seeds with uh, pig manure, uh, so on. So a bunch of different strategies, and we're trying to figure out something that's affordable, right? You want the farmer to be able to walk into Buckeyes, buy everything he needs, leave with fifty-pound bags, not have to do any other darn crazy thing with Amazon or <laughs> whatever. You know, nothing else should have to happen. Uh, you should be able to do this as simply as possible. So <clears throat> there are a bunch of technical problems that emerge, of course, once you get into the details. The biochar of the pH is from nine to 11. This is easily alkaline enough to kill everything that I'm gonna add to it, including the seed. So you can neutralize that with uh, sulfuric acid. But this changes the whole nature of the project a fair amount. It's no longer something you would do with, you know, turn your loose, children loose with it. <laughs> well, no, you need to glove up and have protective, personal, personal protective equipment. Uh, you know, that, that's not gonna work. The clay is also, all the clays that I had, except for cat litter, cat litter is neutral. But if you go buy bentonite clay, like Wyoming bentonite, sodium bentonite clay, or vol clay, which is calcium bentonite, which you can get in 50 pound bags at Buckeyes, but those pHs are more than nine too. So those are also too alkaline. Uh, it turns out you can buy a very expensive red seed ball clay from Amazon, but it's expensive. That's not gonna scale well. Uh, <clears throat> I'd also started by saying, well, we're gonna take these plant residual plant or plant residues and put them in the compost to get the endophytes. So as a dumb idea, it's much better to grow the plants in the compost. Just let the plants raise them up in the compost. So you have a compost full of plant with peace plants, compost full of camelina plants, compost full of wheat plants. And the endophytes are necessarily in the compost all through the root system. They're all around the root system. So 
That's a much better way to make sure that you're actually growing the endophytes. Uh, the Camelina seeds are too small to be the center of a seed ball, so you have to put them on the outside to make them more of a seed bomb. Um, the seed pellet integrity is difficult to maintain. It's into fracture. <clears throat> Other people have managed to do this, but they don't tell you how they do it usually. There's very little literature about how exactly they do this. But what there is suggests that you need more than 50% clay. And so we've got to figure out the clay thing. And the clumsy, there's a, you can choose the wrong mixer, it turns out. I tried that once. So, uh, and then there's all these other binder problems. So yeah, anyway, uh, you can try and deal with those. We had some logistic problems. The drought uh, delayed, the drought killed soybeans that were supposed to be growing in the two-acre field where our trial was supposed to happen. The uh, death of the soybeans caused the farmer to lose interest in maintaining other things happening in the field, with the result that we grew a lot of Palmer amaranth and, um, and crabgrass, and they went to seed before they got sprayed with glyphosate. So, so we had you know, a no, no, number of ugly problems happening in the two-acre field. And so I wound up adding a lot of very small parallel plot trials on my farm to try to fill in what were going to be gaps in our experience here. And then, uh, and then the predation issue turned out the Amazon seaball thing uh, works. So the first trial was these three bins on the, on the left. You've got plant residues thrown into the bins that are supposed to be composting. Don't do that. Do this instead. This is camelina and, and wheat and peas and stuff growing in the compost pile. That's a good idea. That's going to work. <clears throat> um, the tiny camelina seeds that, that are really are too tiny to be the center of a seed ball. Uh, the seed, seed bomb clay works great. It avoids predation. It's just expensive and it doesn't, isn't going to scale, um, at least not purchased from Amazon. Um, the mixer, if you decide you need a mixer, you don't want the big blue Lowe's mixer. It's great for uh, crushing biochar into powder, but it's not very good for mixing a seed ball. The yard mix is great. If you decide you need to make seed balls, use that. The power button's on the front. It's got a nice big flat space underneath. You can take out the mixing paddles that would use for um, mixing cement or mortar. And it's a good size. You can make hundreds and hundreds of maybe thousands of seed balls in there pretty fast. And you just put in some clay, put in some compost, put in the seeds, start it tumbling, and then start spraying water at it. A little misty water, and it'll, it'll work. Um, <clears throat> Before the mice and after the mice. So the seed bomb play is what worked. So the, this uh, tray full of all kinds of things that I was trying, I thought, you know, biochar will discourage the mice. No, they ate it all. So, so that's, that, that was over one night of, uh, you know, observation. So they just destroyed it. Now I got another one. Um, uh, the vol clay, I mentioned the calcium bentonite vol clay. This is really good for batching your pond. If you've got a leak in the dam, you pour this stuff in there, it swells up to like 10 times its original size and plugs all the leaks. So that's great for, for the dam. It's terrible for a seed ball. <clears throat> and it actually stopped anything from growing. It's a little bit hard to tell in that picture, but um, there are a few wheat plants on the picture on your right, <clears throat> but there are no peas. So this whole, this whole these, this, there's two rows here of, Vol clay, and there's nothing going on there. Um, this side is with an anti herbicidal tea, and this side is without an anti herbicidal tea. This is on a small plot that I, where I had uh, just drenched this thing with 2,4-D <clears throat> and uh, turned out not to matter. So those post emergent herbicides really are post emergent. You put them on and then plant a week later, mm, they don't do anything. So, so you, you know, maybe the simple solution is just spray stuff that you want on there instead of trying to make the seed pellets. So if I were revising my plan to start again right now, which I probably will, I would add radish as a cover crop because the camelina is so tiny, such a tiny delicate plant that it doesn't provide any significant root mass. And so it's not gonna add much carbon to the soil. So if I'm really trying to repair soil in one season, I would put radishes in there, even though they're probably gonna get killed over winter. But if you plant them in the early enough in the fall, they'll Make some radish, <clears throat> and then um, 
I would go to the cover crop in local soil for epigenetic seeds, like I did. I'd go to cover crop in compost for symbiotic microbes, which I didn't, but I'm doing now. Evaluate the herbicide residual issue, which may or may not be an issue. I use a seed drill for shallow planting <clears throat> uh, to, to get the seeds planted. I would use the compost tea sprays. I would uh, carefully select my weather, uh, try to plant when there's going to be rain, and crimp the cover crop and plant crash crop into it. So we'll be doing that um, this spring, Lord willing, and we'll go from there. <clears throat>